primary operator. What design decision did I apparently make in my database? And recall that numint and numchar, they're actually optional, right? There's math A, which doesn't have a number, but there's computer science 50, which doesn't have a char. Um, since you only have one or the other, you have the option to get null. Right. So I made the conscious choice, and we'll see this if we go over to PHP MyAdmin, that because not all courses have a numint or have a numchar, rather than just concatenate them, I'm going to still keep them separate just because that's what I wanted to do. But what's nice about PDO2 is that I can explicitly pass in null if I want that field in my database to actually be null as opposed to the empty string. Now why? Functionally, it might not have a huge difference, but just in terms of um, design, if you have no value for the char or the int, you really should be putting in null. So that's the role of this. So if, there is, if this is empty, the num int variable is empty, let's actually insert null for num int. Otherwise, let's insert the actual int. Same deal for description. And I only realized description accidentally. I was skimming through my database tables, and I realized, wow, some of these courses don't have descriptions. Let me go back, make it a null value optionally. Now I'm executing the statement using PDO. And again, there's no new SQL here. This is all like CS50 style SQL, just with a different library on top of it. But this is what's interesting. Why am I conditionally calling this rollback method? Think back to last week's discussion of databases. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. In case something fails, I want to roll back to the point at which I began my transaction. And this is mostly self-defense. Like, I don't doubt that at some point I'm going to screw this script up, or FAS is going to tweak the data in such a way that the, whole, the query is going to fail because there's some field missing now. And so what I want to make sure that when I'm at midnight running this update script, or I'm using a cron job to do this automatically, if anything goes wrong that was unanticipated, especially while I'm sleeping, I don't want to leave the database in an inconsistent state. I want this whole import to happen or not at all. So the motivations for transactions here are huge. Because what this means is that even at the very last course, course number 4,000 whatever, if there's some kind of syntax error in my code or some kind of logical error in the XML file and that insert fails, no problem, the whole thing fails. Now, our, of course, the, now the, the application has stale data, but at least it has data, and it has correct data, albeit from 24 hours ago. So the worst thing you could do is get your database into some funky state where you maybe have duplicate courses or some courses and things dropping off. So transactions are a huge help with this. They're not just about avoiding race conditions. They're about enforcing atomicity. So it all happens or not at all. So I roll back there, and now recall that I have faculty here, so let me wave my hands at some of this as being um, useful if you want to read up on it at home and improve your own code. But I'm doing something similar now for instructors, iterating over each of the course's faculty. But then notice later on, only at the very bottom, let's see. Uh, yeah, I didn't bother. Actually, you know what? I started doing it. I started. I have the array of departments, but I actually decided, because it was no longer enlightening uh, for lecture, there is no departments table. So I don't actually use that data. But I, what I do have is this join table. So we talked a bit about this last week. Recall that if you have two pieces of data, like courses, and courses have instructors, but that's a many-to-many -many relationship, where a course can have many instructors, and an instructor can teach many courses, you kind of have to somehow be able to rejoin instructors with courses. And so a very common paradigm in SQL, in relational databases, is you have a third table, a join table, that's named similar to both tables, where you take one word from one table, underscore one word from another, or something like that. And what does this have, apparently? This table has catnum, comma, instructor ID. So what I'm doing here is in my third table, I'm making sure that I can reconstruct the association of faculty with courses by having this third table. And we'll actually talk to that table in code in just a moment. Yeah? Would um, doing an insert and nor for departments being a, a lot more costly than the method you would have done? No, insert ignore is actually good. And I'm actually doing it. Yeah, well, let's see. Why did I do it here? Uh, th actually, this is copy, paste, fail. This one was necessary. Why did I do insert ignore into instructors? This was deliberate. 
Right? Like, so Malin teaches two courses. And if I have on my instructor's table a unique, a primary key on instructor ID, the second time I try to insert Malin for, say, the second course, CS164, I would actually get a SQL error, which means I would trigger that if condition, which means I would roll back just because I happen to teach two courses. And same deal for any other instructor. So I do an ignore here, because this is telling SQL it is not an error to, be a, to fail to insert this row if it's already there because of a key collision. So I don't need it elsewhere because unless the data is wrong, I don't need it for the join table. So that, could, that same approach would work for departments. Absolutely. It would be a perfect approach for departments as well. But it assumes that you've defined a unique key, namely a primary key on instructor. So here's the quick tour. I'm in my courses table, which is probably simpler than yours. I have this structure here, catnum, course group, numint, numchar. And I counted up sort of late at night how many numbers are actually in a catnum and how many are in uh, some of these other ones just to get an upper bound. I could be off by one. So don't take my numbers as uh, holy grail. But here's my fields. Notice how many of them I said can be null over on the right. And then if I scroll down to indexes, which of these fields should probably have a key on it? Some kind of index, rather? So catnum should probably have a primary key. And you know what? If I'm often searching on something else, what's another good candidate for an index? What's that? Uh, yeah, so title, yeah, if I want to do like-based searches on title, maybe course group if I want to get all comp sci courses, for instance, and so forth. So a number of design decisions there. And then lastly, instructors is pretty similarly structured, ID first and last. Um, and then course instructors is the interesting one, and this one we'll actually use in code now in just a moment. And this is how we tie the two together. So consider this representative, if imperfect and incomplete, of the kinds of decisions that you might still want to make if you're finding that your own decisions weren't quite panning out as optimal. All right. So, oh, and lastly, lest you use a script like this and then wonder why it doesn't work, there's one line of code that's super important, this. Okay, that's like the save before quitting feature. So that commits the entire transaction and all of the queries that you'd executed up until then. All right, so let's do this. Any questions? Okay, one announcement then from Tommy. Let me, my mic's over here, so. This is gonna be awkward. <laughs> <laughs> just, that's fine. Just okay, so just a reminder that seconds are starting this week. If you find yourself having trouble with code igniting, you know, what is MVC, how do these various components interact, and you haven't really made as much headway as you would have liked on your first project, definitely encourage you to come along to the first section and all the other sections that we'll be having um, each week. They'll be filmed, um, so they'll be available if you can't make it in person. Um, but they're definitely more of an opportunity for you to engage a little bit more with the material and provide a little more guidance on all the projects. Okay. So 4 p.m. Pierce 301 this Wednesday. And future Wednesdays, Wednesdays the GCAL captures the schedule. All right, so let's do this. Um, let's, let's suppose we want to actually implement an API for courses. And what is an API in this sense? It's really our own model. So it's a PHP implementation of uh, API via which we can talk to a courses database. And we're going to borrow some of these design patterns, namely uh, DAO and the singleton pattern, to accomplish the following. First, let me go ahead and load courses.php. This is example zero if you're following along on paper or online or want to afterward today. So this is it for now. Let's actually have this DAO class that does relatively little, but it gives us this helper method that earlier I called get courses. So get courses purpose in life for now is to return for me an array of um, courses from my database. Now let's look at some of the salient characteristics here. So one, in reverse order, what am I doing down here? I have in my get courses method a courses array that's initially empty. Then I'm doing this. Anyone know what this one liner is doing besides getting an instance? Or what is that representative of? Uh, so this isn't quite factory. Factory actually would churn out multiple objects, a new one every time it's called. This is logging into the database. And this is, this is actually an embodiment of that singleton pattern, whereby I've decided with version 0, you know what, I'm going to talk to the same database all the time. My project's not yet complex enough that I need multiple databases. So singletons are OK for the database. And a very common paradigm, though it can take other forms, is to have a class, let's call it database, and then a method inside of it called get instance but it could be called anything. Java people tend to write it this way. And what it does is it returns a database object. But if you call it again, 
it returns the same database object again and again and again. And the upside of this is that probably that method is doing my connection to the database, and then I can funnel all of my queries through it. But I don't need to go through the overhead. For those familiar with networking, there's no overhead of TCP connections, connecting to the database, authenticating. All of that takes milliseconds, which I don't want to spend cyclically. So let's suppose for now that I now have my database handle. This is equivalent, if you think back, to the return value of MySQL Connect in CS50. So now I execute this query. Query. It's not a prepared statement, it's just a raw query, select star from courses. And then in PDO, this is the equivalent, this uh, third to last line, of MySQL fetch a SOS to get an associative array. All right, and I just copied this from the documentation after reading up on the fetch method. So what is this doing? In a loop, it's getting an associative array from the courses table and putting it in the variable called row. And then this syntax here is appending to my courses array that row again and again and again. So what do I get in the end? I get a huge array of courses. And each of those courses is represented not with a class, but how? What data structure am I using at the moment to represent a course? So just an associative array. So it's a very poor man's approach to storing data in some kind of structure. Um, in fact, this is almost what CodeIgniter does. CodeIgniter instead returns to you a standard class object. The only functional difference is that you then use arrow notation to access fields instead of square bracket notation. That's really the only difference. And here, too, is where CodeIgniter's yeah, nice and simple, learning curve relatively low, um, but sloppy. Like it's not actually returning to me a course object. So we can improve upon this. So let's actually see this in action. I